Good morning, Wilton Hills. Good morning, pod parishioners, uh, those who are tuning in to this. And uh, we have some of our SOMA students. I, if you're part of the School of Missionary, M Missional Apprenticeship, raise your hand. Look at it. Okay, students up here. Excellent. I, I don't know if you know this or not, but we have a school now, and uh, it's an it's a intentional community come together, and been at this, what, for two weeks now? And how's it going? Great. It's great. There you go. So, Bill, hey, podcasters, you might want to think about signing up next year. Uh, start, never too early to start advertising for the next year. But uh, it's good to see you guys. I, I, Paul, Eddie, and I had a chance to talk with them when they first got up here, and what a fine bunch. Cre creme de la creme, the cream of the crop. It's just beautiful. Um, so, uh, yes, we're in this series that we're calling You Before Me because it's on hospitality. And uh, today's message is going to be called uh, Be Thou My Vision. Christ, Be Thou My Vision. For reasons that will become clearer in a, here in a little bit. Uh, before I get into that, I want to say a preliminary word, and it has to do with hospitality. Uh, we have, thankfully, we have 100 folks who have signed up to help out in our children's church, but we're still 30 short. And what that has to do about hospitality is this. Uh, Parents, when they come to a church, most of them are more concerned about uh, the, their kids' experience in church uh, than they are about their own experience in church. And uh, our job is to welcome them, right? Which, and to welcome them means we have to welcome their children. Uh, it's extremely important. It's very hard to make a person feel welcome if you say we don't have room for your children. And, and since they have a higher priority on their children's experience than their own, that means Working back in children's church is more important than what I'm doing right now. Think about that. <laughs> this is an important, a very important uh, job. So I, I want to really encourage you to pray, ask God about whether or not uh, this is uh, a ministry that you're supposed to be involved in. Um, and, and you just bring it before the Lord. And I'm convinced the Holy Spirit is telling at least 40 people, 30, 40 people, to, uh, to, to sign up for this. It, it, if, if you're feeling a tug about that, uh, just go to the help desk and tell them that you'd like to volunteer and you can... Do as much or as little as you're able, but we just appreciate any kind of help uh, at all. So uh, I'm going to warn you here at the very start that this is going to be a little bit of an odd message. I usually, I usually have very normal messages, as you all know. But this one's going to be a little bit odd for a couple reasons. One is that the passage that we're going to be looking at, it is a mind-boggling, paradigm-shifting game-changer. Uh, it, 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 it will change the way you look at people and the way you feel about people. It, it's just, it's a complete reframe. It's one that probably many of you haven't heard before. I've only preached on this once before about two years ago. And even if you were here before, because it's such a paradigm-shifting, mind-boggling game-changer, um, it's the kind of thing we need to come back to uh, frequently to remind ourselves about how we're supposed to be looking at people and how we're supposed to be looking at the world. And, and um, yeah, so... so if you haven't heard this before, it's going to feel... Anytime you hear a new paradigm and try out a new paradigm, it feels weird, doesn't it? And it takes practice to live into that. So it's going to be weird for that reason. What makes it also weird is that most people, their idea of the good news is really mediocre news. Or good news for some, but not for others. And this passage contains the real good news. And, and if you're conditioned by the mediocre news, this will feel and even sound too good to be true. Um, I encourage you just to hear it out, because actually the good news is better than even that. If it feels too good to be true, this means that you're heading in the right direction. It's also going to be weird for this reason. We're in a series on hospitality, and um, this message isn't going to sound like it has anything to do with hospitality until the very end. And I want to share it. I say that up front because... Um, it's a kind of message, it's pretty intense, it's got a lot of content, you've got to be using your brain, and I don't want you wasting brain space wondering, gosh, what does this have to do with hospitality? <laughs> Just leave that question aside, and I, trust me, trust me, it, 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 it will, at the very end. So you'll see what I mean. Um, and before I read the passage, I want to share this, to kind of set the whole thing up. Something I learned this week, I didn't know this until this week. How many, did you, did you know that even after the Emancipation Proclamation, Abraham Lincoln's thing in, 19, in 1863, and even after the Civil War ended, decades after the Civil War ended, there were plantations in the Deep South that still owned slaves. I didn't know that. I, I know they had some unjust practices with sharecropping and things like that, but all the information that these folks got 
who were on these plantations, the slaves got, came through their, the, 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 their owners, their masters, and some of them, these masters just didn't tell them that, in fact, they'd been set free. Uh, it's appalling. And this went on for decades. In fact, the last person to find out that they were, in fact, free, and had been free all their life, although they didn't know it, it happened in 1963. A hundred years after the Emancipation Proclamation, finally, it all got ended. It's, it, it's, a, it's absolutely appalling. But, so you have to get into the world of this. These, these folks are, in fact, in a land where they're legally free. They are, in fact, free, but they don't know it because they're under the deception of these owners. And so they still think like slaves and act like slaves because that's all they know. They know. Uh, if you're not getting any kind of information, you just have to judge things by appearances, and by all appearances, we're slaves, so I guess we're still slaves, even though they're living in a land where they're, in fact, free. And I, I, I share that for this reason. Uh, what we're going to see today is that most people, are in a, most people on the planet are in a situation like that. The cross was God's emancipation proclamation for all human beings. It changed everything. Amen. And... But we're in a world that's under great deception. And, and, and so most people just judge things on the basis of appearances. And by appearances, uh, the cross didn't change everything. It didn't set everyone free. And so people just don't think it applies to them. It, it didn't really happen. It doesn't affect how we view the world and things like that. Uh, but see, us kingdom people, our job, our most fundamental job is to get to know what, what is real, to know what is true, and to get our thinking to line up with what, what is true, and to get our behavior to line up with, with what is true. And we're going to find that when we do that, and when we view everybody as they really are instead of how they appear, we will be practicing outrageous hospitality. At first, we've got to know what is real and, and, and in, internalize that. So the passage we're looking at today is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 13 through 17. Passage that caught fire for me about two years ago, and it's still burning very, very hot. It's a game changer. So here's what it says. For if we are beside ourselves, if we're crazy, it is for God. But if we're in our right mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. Think about that. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. So from now on, therefore, and therefore will become pretty important in a little, bit, little while here, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, Everything, everything, everything has become new. Father, uh, we have lived our lives under great deception. I pray, Lord, this morning you open our eyes and open our hearts to see the truth, to receive the truth, to live the truth, and to apply the truth to every encounter in our life. Holy Spirit, only you can do that. If I try to do that, I will be very frustrated. I relax in your sufficiency and, and your power I just ask that you infuse these words with authority that doesn't come from me, but comes from you, to do what only you can do, and that is build the kingdom in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, and in this community, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. So, so, oh, and if, if you up here in front are, are wondering why I have a microphone up here, See, I have a microphone, it's because we've had techno problems, as you did last week, uh, we've had techno problems with the mic, the first two services, and we think we've got it fixed. That's why this stuff's up here. But I wanted a backup just in case. Uh, always, it's always good to have a backup. So I don't have to be up here singing a song waiting for the... Okay, anyways. So people thought Paul was crazy. And it's understandable because Paul sometimes acted kind of crazy. He had a cushy life. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, tribe of Benjamin. He was a muckety-muck, an authority. You know, people respected him, highly educated and all that. He could have had a really cool life, an easy life. But then he gets to know Jesus and turns into this radical missionary church planner, and now his life's filled with hardships. He's, he's, he's beaten in a riot a couple times. He's, he's thrown into prison, and he gets in a shipwreck. I mean, he, it was a hard life. And so people are wondering, why on earth would you do that? What, are you nuts? 
And Paul says, well, and this is kind of tongue-in-cheek, I think. He goes, well, if, if we're nuts, it's, it's for God. Uh, but if, if, we're, if we're saying it's for your sake, I'm not quite sure what to make of that. But then he gives his true motivation. He says, the reason we do what we do and sacrifice what we sacrifice is because the love of Christ urges us on. Now, the word urges in Greek is suneko. Sune, everyone say suneko. 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 And it means to compel, uh, to constrain, uh, or to, to, to be captivated by. So Paul was compelled and constrained and captivated by the love of Jesus Christ. And as some of you know firsthand, when your heart is full of love, you can do some crazy things. But some of you have done crazy things when you're in love, right? Uh, lo love, love is a far, far greater motivator than any other factor on, on, on earth. It's far greater than shame or fear or guilt or social pressure or even the threat of hell. Preachers who rely on shame and guilt and social pressure and stuff like that to try to get people to do what they think they should do, well, they're just revealing that they're not tapped into the love of God. Because if they knew the love of God, they know that's, that's the only real true motivator in the kingdom. And it's the best motivator that there is on the planet. Amen? So, so Paul was compelled by the love of Christ, which tells you he, was, he had a compelling vision of Christ. The vision compelled him. And, and, and for, for Paul, that was his, his view of God. It was all anchored in Jesus Christ, and especially in Jesus Christ crucified. That's why the number one agenda that we have here at Woodland Hills Church is to get people to get all their thinking about God to be anchored in Jesus Christ, and especially in Jesus Christ crucified. And, and, and to have this compelling vision of God. Because when you, it's only to the degree that you have a compelling vision of God that you will be compelled to do things for God, to be building his kingdom. Your, the beauty of your life will never outrun the beauty of your mental picture of God because we're always transformed into the image of God, the God we worship. And the beauty of your own relationship with God will never outrun the beauty of your mental conception of God. So everything hangs on the beauty of your conception of God. So we always want to stay free, completely free of any kind of shame motivation, guilt motivation, social pressure motivation. And instead, what we do is we keep holding up Jesus Christ and all of his beauty and the glory of the God that he has revealed in Jesus Christ, knowing that when, when that, the coin drops in that slot, people start to do radical things for the kingdom. Amen? You don't need guilt and shame when you've got Jesus and you know his true beauty. Now, the aspect of, uh, oh, and, and see, if, if we're thinking rightly, if our picture of God is really accurate, um, it will feel at times too good to be true because we're so conditioned by a mediocre picture of God and sometimes even a terrifying picture of God that when you hear the, about the true God, your brain will say, that's, that's too good to be true. We're so used to good news always being mixed with bad news. But this is just pure good news. So when, 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 when you... Have the sense that, that, that you're, you're, uh, it feels too good to be true. Let that just remind you that you're going in the right direction because the truth is that however beautiful your conception of God is, the true beauty of God outruns that by a billion light years. And so imagine God as beautiful as you can and do it all the time and talk to this beautiful God and, 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 and relate to this beautiful God as beautiful as you can imagine and then tell yourself you're not even close because the truth is, he's much more beautiful than that. But at least you're going in the right direction, and that's all we can hope for. Amen? Everything hangs on your picture of God. So the aspect of God's beauty that Paul mentions in this text this morning is this. He's, he's convinced that if one died for all, he knows that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so God, as this human, died for all, and therefore all have died. That was part of the beauty that compelled Paul to do what he did. All, ha what does that mean? All have died. Uh, it's astounding. Now we begin to see what he means by that when he goes on to say, everything's a new creation, everything old has passed away. Um, this, the, the sense in which all have died is this. All that's old about them is now gone. And what's old is, when, when Paul uses this concept of the old self, he's referring to, what would be true about us and every human being were it not the case that Jesus died for everybody? And what would be true about us if Jesus had not died for everybody is that our sin would separate us from God. What died on Calvary was that self that was separated from God. Everything about everybody that could possibly separate them from God was crucified when Jesus Christ was crucified. Now, that's why Paul, in the same passage, uh, later on in this chapter, I, I had to cut it out because for time reasons, but he says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting anyone's trespasses against them. Why? 
Because all the trespasses have been crucified. <laughs> he says the same thing in Colossians 2, uh, in, in verse 14. He says, when Jesus was nailed on the cross, everything that stood against us, everything the enemy had on us, everything that could ever indict us, everything that could ever condemn us and shame us and guilt on us, us, us it was crucified too. It was abolished, done away with, annihilated. So the whole idea of standing under judgment, the, the whole accounting system, the accusatory system, the evaluating system, it's been blown sky high. It's null and void. That's the reality of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. There's a number of passages that, that capture this. We're just so conditioned to read the Bible in a mediocre way that the beautiful stuff usually just goes in one ear and out the other. But listen to this. Romans 5. He says, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, that's, that's the old self, that's where we would be if Jesus hadn't died, we'd be condemned. So one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by one man's disobedience, the multitude, the many, were made sinners. And when he says many, he doesn't mean many as opposed to all. He's referring to the multitude of the all. Because all. All were in Adam, and so all are now encompassed in Christ. For just as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, talking about Jesus, the multitude will be made righteous. Isn't that special? And, and uh, here's another passage, 1 Corinthians 15. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being, Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all die... So all will be made alive in Christ. Take a deep breath. Now, let's be honest here. Taken in isolation, these passages seem to teach that everyone is saved. And it's a view that's called universalism, or that at least everyone will be saved. It's called universalism. And I will be honest with you that I hope that that is true. I really... Look, at if love believes all things and hopes all things, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, and you love all people, how could you not hope that this is true? And, and if, if God can find a way to save everybody, then I'm sure it will be true. But see, there's also, we have to take the whole counsel of Scripture and weigh everything against, you know, compare and, 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 and read it together. And there's, all, there's a, all these other passages that warn us that, if, if, if someone doesn't, if someone rejects having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that leads to death and destruction. Uh, it, it, what condemns people, it's not their sin. That was taken care of on Calvary. It's the lack of relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And those warning passages have to mean something, right? And on top of that, uh, because our salvation is this love relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ, uh, it's got to be chosen. Love's got to be chosen. A coerced love is not a real love. And so people are always free to reject it. So God can't just set a date where he says, okay, now everyone's going to be saved by this date. He, he just will not lobotomize you to be thinking the true thoughts about, about, about him because uh, that wouldn't mean anything. It's your personal being, you have to choose it. And that's why I don't think these passages necessarily imply universalism. But what they do express, in my view, is that they express God's perspective on things. And God's perspective on things is always the true perspective on things. What these passages ex express is what actually was accomplished on the cross. What they express is the reality that was brought about on Calvary. What is absolutely real. But see, people are free to reject that reality if they so choose. You can do that. We do that all the time. To reject this reality. To say it doesn't apply to me. In fact, I submit to you that that's a pretty good definition of sin. You reject reality as defined by God. And you create your own reality, your own imaginary reality. So we have our own alternative reality. Uh, you can see this in Genesis 3, the, the story of the first sin. Where uh, God tells Adam what's real. Here's what's real. Dude, if you eat of that tree, you're going to die. You can't handle that tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's poison to you. Stay away from it. That's what's real. But then that slithering serpent shows up. And, and, and offers an alternative reality. Uh, did God say that you're going to die when you eat of that tree? That's not real. What's real is that God's lying to you. What's real is that he's threatened by this tree, doesn't want any competition. What's real is that that tree, far from killing you, it's going to make you wise so you can be like God. And you want that. And Eve believes this lie, and then we have the first sin. Sin is about creating your own alternate reality. Think as though, as though you're God and you get to define what is real. And we do it all the time. 
Think back, and this might for some of you be hard, but think back to the last time you sinned. And I know, I know some of you righteous folks have to really think hard. Well, when's that last time? Hey, hey. Uh, yeah. But, but try. And, and see, look, and, and, and do it, introspect what was going on in your head when you did that. And I'll tell you what was going on. What was going on is that you were thinking and then acting as though what is true is not true. You were thinking and acting as though God didn't exist, or at least God wasn't right there, present while you're doing this thing. We think we can get like our privacy from God. He's not looking. Uh, so we, we, we're acting as though Jesus Christ isn't Lord and doesn't have total claim on your life. And you're thinking and acting as though you're not a child of God and, and, and that you're not better than the stupid sin that you're engaging in. That's what We create an alternate reality, and that's how we sin. So the reality here, folks, is that the cross changed everything for everybody. That's what's real. Uh, they, 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 they teach that. A new creation has come. Everything has changed. Everything old is gone. Everything is new. And now God has got this bear hug around all of humanity. What these passages are teaching is that all of us, all of us, all of us were outsiders. But all of us, all of us, and the us is humanity, are now made insiders. That's what's real. What's real is that as all were in Adam, so all are in Christ. That's what's real. What's real is that one died for all, and therefore all have died. That's what's real. What's real is that God has got a claim on every human being that has ever existed. Paul says that, that the, all have died. That means every single person, past, present, and future, in some sense, died on that cross. The old self was, is, has been put to death, and all things are new. What's real is that the sin of every human being, past, present, and future, was nailed to the cross when Jesus was nailed to the cross, and so all has been forgiven. God's not holding anyone's trespasses against him. That's what's real. What's real is that the cross changed everything for everyone. Now, people could still think and act as though that's not true, if they want to. Whether it's because they choose to reject it, and they just like their alternate reality more than the real reality, or they're under deception. But either way, I mean, you think and act as though you're not forgiven, as though you're not an insider, as though your sins are still around, as though the cross didn't change anything. People can still do that, whether through deception or because they reject it. But it doesn't change reality. Reality is reality. You, you can pretend like, it, like, 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 like you can have your own reality, but reality always wins. If you don't believe me, then pretend like you can fly and jump off of a skyscraper. You're free to do that if you want, but reality will win in this case. And so also the fact that people don't know this or they reject this doesn't mean that it's not real. No, reality's still there. And so here's the thing, folks. Our most fundamental job as disciples is to, is to know real reality and to get our thinking to line up with real reality as defined by God and to get our behavior to line up with real reality uh, as defined by God. Our job is to take this reality and apply it not just to our own lives, but to apply to everybody else as well because the reality, the truth, includes everybody else as well. And that has got to determine how we view people and, and how we think about people and how we interact with people. That's why Paul goes on to say this, and I want to read it again because it's a mind-boggling, paradigm-shifting uh, game changer. From now on, therefore, because one died for all and therefore all have died, from, therefore we're, we're, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has been made new. Now, the human point of view. Paul, the word is sarx in Greek. Uh, its little translation is flesh. But when used in this kind of a context, it doesn't mean flesh like your skin. It means just a worldly way of looking at things. The worldly point of view is looking at things as though what you know to be true in the spiritual realm wasn't true, as though the spiritual realm didn't exist. It's looking at the world and, and determining truth on the basis of appearance, as though a, it, the only thing that's real is what you can see, what you can sense with your five senses. That, that's the human point of view. It's a deceptive point of view because it, 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 it doesn't acknowledge the reality of anything that's not right there in front of you. So Paul says he once regarded Christ this way. He, looked at, he, he thought of Jesus as just an ordinary human being who got crucified by the Roman government. That's the, the human point of view. But his view of Christ changed radically when he met Jesus and got literally knocked off his high horse 
in Acts 9, and, 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 and came to know God as he's revealed in Jesus Christ. And so now Paul sees a whole lot more in Jesus than what he saw when he looked at it from, for him from a human point of view. He knows that God himself was in Christ, reconciling the world back to himself. But it isn't, wasn't just Paul's view of Christ that changed. No, it was his view of everybody. So he says, now we, we, we don't regard anyone from a human point of view. We don't, our view of people isn't based on how they appear or what they do or, 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 or any kind of evaluation of them. Rather, he says, if anyone is in Christ, if you belong to Christ, then there is a new creation. There is a brand new creation. Now, here's the thing. A lot of translations have, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. As though Paul's talking about the individual who's in Christ. And I bet those of you who have heard teaching on this passage, that's probably what you were taught. Um, now here's the thing. The word he is is not in the Greek. And get ready. We're going to learn some Greek. You ready to learn some Greek? Oh, this is a smart church. Are you ready to learn some Greek? Yeah. All right. Here's what we have in the original Greek. I'll do a little inter interlinear thing here. Hoste etis in Christo kinekatesis. Kinekatesis. Everyone say kinekatesis. Yeah. You got to stutter when you do it. Can you kick a thesis? All right. <laughs> and it literally is translated like this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. Now that's kind of weird because it looks like Paul's missing a verb, right? And, and so translators supply the verb. Uh, and so they put in, he is, uh, before, between Christ and new creation. He is a new creation. But see, that's not in the original Greek. It's like, would Paul really forget to put in a verb, <laughs> especially if he's writing under divine inspiration? Maybe, but, but uh, I don't think so. I think it's intentional. Because, see, he's contrasting the way we look at the world when we're not in Christ from the human point of view from the way we should look at the world and look at all people in the world when you're in Christ. And so he's saying, instead of looking at people from a human point of view, well, if anyone's in Christ, new creation. It's like a dramatic pause. This is what you see, new creation. And that's why in the very next phrase, he says, look, Edu in Greek, look, everything old has passed away. Behold, everything is new. He's talking about how we look, how we see things. And in case you're not yet convinced, though you should be, he uses the word therefore, therefore, hostess. And, and uh, when you, whenever you see a therefore, you got to go back and look what came just before it because it's referring to what just came before it. And what came just before this phrase, what came just before this phrase is, we no longer regard anyone from, from a, a human point of view. Rather, if we're in Christ, new creation. He's still talking about how your view of the world, your view of people changes when you're in Christ, or at least ought to change when you're in Christ. You don't look at anyone from a merely human point of view. You see them as they really are. Because as they really are is defined not by appearances, but by what Jesus did for them on the cross. Amen. What they really are is part of this new creation. They maybe don't know it. In fact, they probably don't know it. And, and so they don't reflect any of it in their life. But uh, that doesn't change reality. And our job as disciples is to get our thinking and our seeing and our behavior to line up with what is real as defined by God. And so we're not to see anyone from a human point of view. Rather, every person we engage with, we should see them in the light of the truth that one died for all and therefore all have died. We're to see them in light of the truth that everything uh, that, that's sinful about them that could possibly separate them from God is old, it's passed away, it was crucified on Calvary. We're to see everybody, everybody, uh, in light of the truth that, that, that they, are, they were outsiders but God has made them insiders in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what's real. That's what's real. We're to see everybody in light of the, the knowledge of the truth that Everything was nailed to the cross. Everything that could separate them from God has been nailed to the cross and taken care of on Calvary. We're to see everybody in light of the truth that they are, in fact, insiders. They are, they're, God calls them insiders, claims them as insiders, and we've got to reflect that in how we engage with them, how we think about them, how we speak to them. Uh, it, it, they don't know that, but, but, but we do, and it's got to affect how we see people. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful way of looking at the world. It is, see, norm, if you're looking at things from a human point of view, there's always judgments in your mind. We're always evaluating, comparing, contrasting, and, and, and all that stuff. That's a human thing. And it takes up energy. We don't know it, but judgments take up energy. It, it, it saps you, and it blocks the flow of love into our life and through our life. 
But when you start seeing people and, and, and intentionally you know, being transformed by the renewing of your mind, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, Paul says in Romans 12 too. The pattern, the human point of view, the way everyone else thinks. Don't think the way everyone else thinks and don't see people the way everyone else sees people, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And as you begin to do that, uh, I encourage us all to be doing this every day, that it, you'll find that it releases in you a capacity to love and a capacity for compassion that you never dreamed was possible before. All of our emotions depend on what we're seeing. What do you see? What do you see? We've got to see something different. They're part of a new creation. So it's like this, for example. Everybody at, at your office hates your boss because your boss is a jerk. Your boss is overly demanding. Your boss is a control freak. He's ornery all the time. So they gossip about the boss and talk bad about the boss. And it's kind of what you do. Because they're looking at the boss from a human point of view. And human points of view always evaluate things and judge things and, and whatnot. But not you. If you're in Christ, what you're supposed to see is new creation. This is a part of the new creation. And, and the boss doesn't know this, but what you know is that that ornery, overly demanding, jerky, control freak self of his was crucified 2,000 years ago. And so you treat him as that because that's what's real. And you think about your boss like that because that's what's real. And it could just be that as you begin to treat your boss differently, your boss begins to wake up a little bit to the truth and it comes to maybe change a little bit uh, because you're loving on them when everyone else is hating on them. This is what it is to see everybody in Christ Jesus. It's not easy, especially when you have patterns in your brain about people that you don't like. And we all have people like that. Uh, and, and, and we instinct, instinctively activate those neural nets. Oh, I'm sick of a sick of a jerk. So that's a habitual thought. But we've got to be disciples of our brain first and foremost. If you can't take back the three and a half pounds of, 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 of matter between your ears, you're not going to take back the world for God, all right? Everyone's trying to take back the world for God or take back America for God or whatever. And when, when they don't take back the three and a half pounds uh, of, of noodles between your ears, this is, this is the plot of ground that we have to be discipling, amen? Amen. Take every thought captive to Jesus Christ. Let Christ be your thought. Let Christ be your action. Let Christ be your vision. How you view everybody. So we bring everything captive. And so this is why the call for hospitality is on the top of God's priority list, folks. Because hospitality is just what it looks like when we are thinking and acting accurately. We regard everybody as insiders because they are insiders. That's what's real. We're just getting our behavior and life to line up with what is true. See, from a human point of view, there's always this a tribal sort of thing. It's, it's, it's a staple of, of humanity since the fall. There's always an us and a them. There's always an insider and outsider. And the insiders are the people that I like and that are like me and that look like me and that, 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 that talk like me and believe what I believe and that I'm comfortable with. Those are the insiders. And everybody else, to some degree, is an outsider. And, and we look at the outsiders as those people. And, and, and maybe you look at them with a little bit of suspicion because they're different. And, and so there's this us-them thing. But see, if you're in Christ and you're seeing accurately, you're seeing what is real as defined by God, you're not judging by appearances, there is no place for an us and a them. There's no place for an insider or outsider because everybody is an us and everybody is inside. You just saw it there in Scripture. And our job is to act like that. And if we act like that, we will be hospitable. <laughs> So Christians always assume that, oh, that unbeliever, you know, they're not a part of us because they don't believe, or especially that opponent of Christianity, they're not a part of us. You know, they're an outsider, and, and we're, we're the insiders. And when, when Christians think of, with, from a human point of view, you'll always end up with the church as a sort of special holy club. And us to them, righteous, unrighteous, saved, unsaved. No Jesus, they don't know Jesus. Love by God, not love by God. There's always, why aren't we special? And no, it's true, and then when, 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 when it, Others look at, 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 at the world from a human point of view, which everyone does. There's always these things about who's inside, who's outside, and, and those outsiders are the people that, are, are, that have different culture and that don't look like us, a different race, and a different accent or whatever. It's those people. And then when people look at folks, undocumented immigrants from a natural point of view, well, they don't belong here. They're not part of us. And that's government. It always operates with a human point of view. Let that be what it is. But for us, folks... We are only allowed to look to see one thing. I don't care who you're looking at. There's one thing to see, and that is new creation. Old passed away. Everything is new. And to think about them, interact with them on that basis. Amen. If we are thinking accurately, uh, we will be outrageously hospitable. Because the stranger that you're welcoming, you know, is not a stranger. They're actually a brother, so now you're 
treating them like a brother. They do belong. They're insiders. They don't know it. But heck, we hardly know it. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. Let's be honest here. Uh, we're not some kind of special club, the ones who know. No, all of us are in process. Uh, some faster than others, but we're all in process on getting our thoughts and life to line up. We hardly know this truth. And for a lot of you, you're hearing this for the first time. Uh, so that's all the more reason why we can't make this insider-outsider thing. No, we're all just a bunch of sinners who were all outsiders, who now are made all insiders, praise God, because of the love of Jesus Christ displayed for us on Calvary. Christians always assume, or many often assume, that you have to believe in order to belong. But from the kingdom perspective that we're seeing here this morning, we are to have people belong before they believe, and even belong in order that they hopefully will sometime come to believe. Because as, as we begin to treat them the way they really are, it gives an opportunity for them to begin to discover who they really are and who the true God is and what real reality is as defined by God as opposed to deceptive appearances. Praise God. So I, I gave an assignment two weeks ago. Remember it? And I just want to repeat it here. If the kingdom is characterized by outrageous hospitality because there is no insider or outsider distinctions, there's an us without a them. The kingdom is an us without a them. We treat everybody as an us. And so that, 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 that puts on display outrageous hospitality, which means that if we're kingdom people, when we come together, it ought to be characterized by outrageous hospitality. It has to start here, whether it's in the weekend service or the refuge or echo or whatever. And so I want to encourage everybody, when you come to church, you come to get blessed, that's great. You come to join and worship, that's great, wonderful. And you meet family and friends and, and connect, that's, that's normal. But make space for the stranger, and the stranger is just somebody you don't know. Meet one person at least, and welcome them into the church. And the goal is that everybody who comes to this church should leave feeling welcomed. Amen. And the only way to feel welcomed is by being welcomed. I'm <laughs> profound sometimes, I know. <laughs> if they're not welcomed, there's got no reason to think that they're welcomed. And this is just a, treat them as insiders because they are insiders. They ought to feel like, and I don't care, I don't care what else might appear true about them. It doesn't matter. Name the most heinous thing you can imagine. They're still one of us. Amen. Most disgusting thing you can imagine. They're still one of us. The thing that turns you off the most. They're still one of us. Give any cause you want. I'll just go zip, 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 zip. Nope, nope, nope. All we're allowed to see is new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything is new. Praise God. That, folks, is outrageous hospitality. <laughs> Amen. Yes. The good news is really good. The way you can tell the good news from the false news is that the good news is really good. It's not mediocre, and it doesn't apply just to some. It applies to everybody, and it's the best news imaginable. Praise God. Okay, we're going to have a time of communion now. And communion is, is uh, the renewal of the covenant and a reminder of, 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 of the covenant and what God did for us to be included here, what God is willing to do to make space for us. Uh, it's, it's really a reminder of reality. And so as we're taking communion this, this morning, uh, do it as a reminder of who the true God is, the unfathomably beautiful God who became a human being and died for everybody on the cross. That's what's real. And let it be a reminder of who you are. You are, a, you are an insider. You've been forgiven. Uh, the, the slate is clean for you. And let it be a reminder about what is true about everybody else. And as we take this communion, do it with a commitment to make space for that stranger. It won't happen unless we're intentional about it. But God was intentional in making space for us and it cost him everything. And then he says to us, kingdom people, go and do likewise. Make space to encompass others. So on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup that they were going to drink, or the bread that they were going to eat first. And, and he, he said, this bread is the bread of is, is my body, which is to be broken for you. And so whenever you take this bread, come together and eat of it, then do it in remembrance of me. Remember what I was willing to pay, what I was willing to do, what I was willing to suffer to make space for you, to welcome you into the triune community. And then he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new and everlasting, cup of the new, new and everlasting covenant, but this cup is, represents my blood that is shed for you. Let it remind you of what God was willing to do to make space for us, to welcome us and everybody else into the triune community. And he tells us to go and do likewise, to make space for others. Uh, we here at Wilden Hills Church have open communion, which just means we don't do any background checks. Uh, if you want to take communion, we invite you to take communion. We encourage you to do that. Uh, there's tables around the auditorium. It's all gluten-free, so you don't have to worry about that. And, and this is entering this time of worship. Like, really pour our minds into it. He's worthy of our everything, of our all. 
And, and, and then when you feel led to do so, get up and just go and take communion. Um, if, if you're here with some people and you want to share it together, just pick up the elements and go in a corner or something and, and, and have your own little communion service. Uh, we, we encourage that. Most of all, let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ and on true reality, celebrating what's really real because of what Jesus did for us. He is our vision. We see everything and everyone in light of him. Amen. I just got whammed. Um, you know, I really, I, I really, it occurs to me that every, I've had every sinful thing in our life would be, would evaporate if we fully saw the beauty of God. It would compel us right out of that. And I begin to kind of get a picture of what, what it will look like when, when the, the veil of deceptive appearance is fully stripped away and the reality of what God has made us to be is put on full display. It's going to be magnificent. It's going to be outrageously gorgeous. Our job is to try to see that as much as possible now. Every person you come in contact with, let Christ be your vision. Oh. It's, it's, so, it's so beautiful. He's just so... And I wonder how much of the baggage we carry of the old because we don't let ourselves dream and dare to see the beauty. Let the Spirit just open your eyes to the beauty and uh, whatever that looks like. Because that's what compels. That's what constrains. That's what captivates us and leads us into walking into the reality of who we really are and seeing everybody else as who they really are. I, I, I want to encourage you uh, this week on the back of the bulletin, we have a passage printed out and then the liturgical way of reading that is part of a church tradition that goes back over 1,500 years. And it can be powerful. And letting the word saturate into us is one of the ways that we become who we really are and are transformed into his likeness. So I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to pray, be practicing the presence of God, as Shauna uh, wonderfully talked about last week. Uh, be aware of God's presence at all times, and that helps us to remember how we're seeing things, how, 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 how we're viewing people. I encourage us to be disciples of our brain. Pay attention to what you're thinking about people and, and how you're seeing people, and let Christ be your vision. And finally, I, I want to uh, remind you to, when you come to church next week, in fact, do it as we're leaving here. Uh, make space for at least one other person to welcome them in because they are welcomed in. God has done that, and our job is to reflect that truth, just to be accurate in how we behave and stuff. And uh, finally, if, if God's pulling on your heart about that, this coming part of the children's ministry, we need 30 folks here in order to welcome folks who, who attend here. And, and uh, if God's calling on you to be part of that, however much or little that may mean, stop by at the help desk and sign up. As we leave here, can we do it with the people who are committed to seeing the world as it truly is, not from a human point of view, but from a Christ point of view. Let Christ be your vision. See the new creation. See the old gone. See everything new. Celebrate that. It's a beautiful way of looking at the world, and it will make you a, beautify, a beautifier of the world, and we need a lot of that right now. Amen. God bless you guys. Go out loving your neighbors.